welcome to another Friday night. Last week we started looking at some of the faulty logic tactics that people use when they're in a conflict and instead of admitting they're wrong, they use these tactics to try and win the argument, but they're really faulty and they're really common tactics that happen a lot in the complex trauma families. And we looked at it kind of a bunch of different areas where you're going to run into it. So number one, you're going to run into it with a narcissist all the time. If you ever are in a, an argument with them, they will use these task, tactics all the time. If you're with a gaslighter, they're going to use these tactics all the time in order to mess with your brain, in order to get you to doubt yourself. It is just what they do. If you're with an organization or a religious institution and you're starting to challenge some of the stuff they do or teach and or a family system and you're starting to deconstruct some of the stuff in your family to see whether it's healthy or not, they're going to use these things to try and get you to go back to the old way of thinking, to just comply with what they do and not challenge anything. And so these are, are so very, very common. Another one that you can think about is these are going to be used by people who are in a position of authority that are abusing that authority. So just think of a corrupt cop, a corrupt politician. So the corrupt cop, he's bringing drugs through and, and using his position and power in order to get drugs and get rich off of that. And so they're going to use a lot of these tactics in order to make the good people look like the bad guys and to get the attention off of them. So last week we looked at the first 15 of these and we got 15 left to go. So let's dig in and get through the rest of these. So number 16 is what is known as the appeal to tradition fallacy. And it basically is, we've always done it this way. We've always believed this, so it must be right. And so it's a, if a group of people has believed something or done something for a long time, for generations, it must be true. But if you think about it, that's actually quite uh, wrong. It's a, it's a fallacy because what people believed in the past has no impact really on whether what they believed was true. It could have been wrong back then. And so it's a common fallacy and you'll hear it tons within the complex trauma family, but you'll hear it in organizations as well. So just some examples, you'll hear organizations that say, we're not going to change the style of music we play at the school concert or in church because we've always done it this way. And so we're going to keep doing it this way. So they're appealing to tradition as the authority that makes it right to keep doing what they're doing. Or you get some people that come out of a family system that for generations has been very role oriented for men and women. And they go, in my family, the wife always cooks and summer, supper's always on the table at five. Work for us, so it's going to be the way we do it. And you're not allowed to challenge that because that's the way it's always been done. Or... In my family, we've always done these traditions at Christmas, and I don't care if my kids today don't like these traditions, don't find them meaningful. We've always done it this way, so we're going to keep doing it this way. Or in my family, nobody ever challenged grandma. Nobody ever set boundaries with grandma. Grandma ruled. Grandma did whatever she wanted, and that's the way it's got to continue. And so those are all appealing to tradition type things. One other one that you might get if you grew up in a complex trauma family is you go out into a social setting and, and you ask somebody how they're doing. And somebody takes you aside and goes, you can't do that. You, you can't ask people how they're doing when other people are around. And what you begin to realize is, whoa, they're doing that out of a place of fear because when they did that, they got in trouble. And now they don't want anybody else to do it. And so it's more about their upbringing, more about their fear than it is about what is healthy. So let me just add an important note here. It's really important to understand that there's nothing wrong with tradition. We all need traditions. We value traditions. But 
the problem is, is when we elevate tradition to the ultimate place of authority. So because we've always done it, it must be right and we need to keep doing it. We always have to look at traditions and deconstruct them to see if they if they go against love. So what might have been meaningful 100 years ago doesn't mean it's meaningful today. It could be quite boring, quite impractical today. And so traditions can change. Secondly, just because you did a tradition long ago where you let grandma be a narcissist doesn't mean it's right because that violates love. That violates healthy relationships. And so traditions need to be deconstructed. Are they meaningful today? Do they violate love in any way? Number 17, the burden of proof fallacy. So this one happens when a person makes a claim, but then they don't prove that claim. And so if you challenge them about that claim, then they go, well, prove me wrong. And so they put the burden of proof on you Whereas they're the one that made the claim. And if you can't all of a sudden prove them wrong, then they go, see, that means I must be right because you can't prove me wrong. So what is important to realize is if a person makes a claim, they're the one that the burden of proof is on them to prove that claim. It's not on the other person to disprove them. And so it's invalid to claim that your claim must be true until you can prove me wrong. So let me give you some examples around that that hopefully will help you. If somebody was to say there are fairies in the attic and you go, prove it. And they would go, well, you prove it wrong. And then their conclusion is because you can't prove there's not fairies in the attic, then it must be true that there are fairies in the attic. So, so you begin to see, whoa, that's there, I, I just something's not right there. The onus is should be on them. If you're claiming there's fairies in the attic, you prove that there are fairies in the attic. Don't put the onus on me. And often you'll get the same with religious groups around certain beliefs, like belief in God, and, and somebody will challenge that and they'll go, well, you disprove it. You prove me wrong. And they put the onus on the other person instead of saying the onus is on me to prove that. Another twist to this that happens in a lot of complex trauma families is let's say the father or the authority in the family just makes a claim we need to do this and you go well why just do what you're told I don't need to explain myself all of a sudden there's they don't feel they are responsible to explain themselves the onus now is on you if if you're challenging this you're going to have to prove them wrong because they're not going to give evidence for why they're doing what they're doing and so you'll get a lot of statements that they just make strong discipline is what kids need today if they're going to turn out okay and you go but 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 prove me wrong or I heard take your wife out for dinner once a week and you're going to have a great marriage. So that's what I'm going to do. Take my wife out for dinner once a week. And, and so they just make this claim. They just act on this claim. And if you challenge it, they don't defend it. It's up to you. And so that kind of reasoning happens a lot and you can see it. The next one is super common. It's called the slippery slope fallacy. And so you may have grown up in a home where you were going to go do something and your dad might have said, oh, slippery slope. And you know exactly what is being meant there. And, and, and so the, the idea is that if you do something, well, that's going to inevitably lead to this, which will inevitably lead to this, which will inevitably lead to this, which will lead to disaster. And so if you do this, you're going to enter a slippery slope that's going to end up in a very bad place but they have no supporting evidence they just say this chain of events is going to happen if you do this first action so example don't get a credit card if you do slippery slope you tend to spend money you don't have then you're going to max out your card then you're going to be in debt then you're going to start gambling in order to try to get the money back in a big win and you're normally going to lose, so then you're going to steal money, then you're going, your partner's going to leave you, then you won't be able to feed your dog, and your dog's going to die, so don't get a credit card. Silly example, but that's kind of what the slippery slope is. So you might have heard the slippery slope around, don't get a tattoo, or don't start dancing, that's a slippery slope, or don't 
don't go start kissing on a date because that's a slippery slope or don't wear makeup that's a slippery slope or don't go to a bar or don't have a a beer that that's a slippery slope so there's two things i need to note around this the first is for many people coming out of complex trauma all of those things that i mentioned can be a slippery slope if they start having a drink it could lead to addiction but it might not. It's, so it's not dependent on whether the activity of having a drink is good or bad. It's dependent on how vulnerable the person is because of their underlying issues. And so some people need to be aware that certain activities are dangerous for them because they're very vulnerable and it could be a slippery slope. And so they need to think about that. That's very important. So I'm not saying there's not a slippery slope. What I'm saying is that for many people who use the slippery slope argument, they're trying to control you from never doing anything outside of what they want. And their thinking is all controlled by fear. And it's like, I'm afraid you're going to make bad decisions. So my solution is go to the other extreme. And so let's go to just total purity, total, total avoidance, total abstinence from anything that could potentially lead to disaster. It's fear driven. And that is what is so common with any complex trauma families. Now, the next one is connected to the slippery slope, but it's slightly different. So it's called to the appeal, appeal to probability fallacy. And so it comes out of Latin words that basically, if it something could happen, it will happen, it is really what it's about. If it's possible or probable, then it is going to happen. And so an example of this would be most startup companies fail. So there's no point you trying to start a new company because it's just going to fail. So because it's probable that it could fail, why bother? Because it's going to fail. Or... 90% of job applicants don't get a job. So why bother applying? You're not going to get a job either. So again, you can see it's a fear-driven thing. Another one would be people that go, if you stop going to church, then your life's going to be unsatisfying and, and you're going to have a very difficult life. That's probable in some cases. But to use that to say that's for sure going to happen, that, that there's a flaw there. And so what you begin to realize, this is not about facts. This is more about a person's fears and biases that are coming into play in all of that. Another one that you hear a lot in recovery would be, if you start dating, you're going to relapse. So you got to stay away from relationships. You got to, and, and there's a time and a place where, yes, you probably got to stay away from relationships, because you are too vulnerable, and if you did start dating, you would relapse. But to continue to use that, even though a person's growing a lot, is still to let fear run the show. And so I hope you can see it's a tricky thing that you gotta be really wise about, but to just use that to try to keep people from ever taking risks, from ever trying anything, is now letting fear run the show. The next one, very common as well, middle ground fallacy. And basically it assumes that a compromise between two extreme positions must be the truth. So if you got two people who are total opposite ends in an argument, then you just say, well, let's make a compromise. That must be the right way to go. The problem with that is what happens if one or both extremes are totally wrong? To, to meet in the middle is not going to be truth. It's going to be error, a blend of error. But some people do that just to keep the peace, just to try to find a solution. They use this. So just an example, let's say from business, Lola thinks the best way to improve sales is to redesign the company website. And John is totally against redesigning the company website. So let's meet in the middle and just redesign parts of the website. Well, that might help, but that might be the totally bad decision. Another one is 
many people from complex trauma get this. You realize you're in a relationship with somebody that's toxic, a narcissist, they're never going to change, this is never going to work out or be healthy, and so you just say, the relationship's over, I'm done. They come back, go, I don't want the relationship to end, I don't want the relationship to end. So what do they do? They propose a middle ground. Well, why don't we just meet once a month for coffee? And that sounds like such a good solution. That sounds like it's going to make everybody happy. You're going to kind of get your way. The relationship's over. I, I, I'm still going to get to see you. But do you see the hook in there, the barb? What they're really saying is if I can still stay in touch with you once a month, I can still influence you. And hopefully I can get you back. It's a game. There's a secret agenda to that. You get the same with a controlling husband. He doesn't want you to have any friends. You want to have some friends. So he proposes a compromise, middle ground, which says, why don't you just have all your friends come over to your house? And, and I'll just be in the other room doing stuff. That sounds like a good solution, but it's still him meddling, controlling, overseeing everything that's happening in your life. And so it's not really a solution. It's him winning. The next one is known as the sunk cost fallacy. And basically it is the person that uses it justifies maintaining a decision or a specific course of action because of the amount of time and money they've already spent on that course of action. So, for example, I'm not enjoying this book, but you know what? I bought it, so I might as well finish it. So the justification for continuing a crappy book is I spent money on it, so I might as well get, try to get my money's worth. There's just something not quite right there. Or a person that says, I spent $10,000 repairing this lemon of a car so far. Well, I might as well spend another five grand instead of getting rid of it, instead of just taking your losses. It tries to justify continuing in a bad course of action. So you'll get it in complex trauma like this. Well, I spent 10 years with an abusive husband who's totally unavailable emotionally. Well, I might as well just stick out another 10 years. A little bit of love is better than none at all. And they justify continuing in a bad relationship because they've already spent 10 years in that relationship. The next one is the equivocation fallacy. And this one is where a person uses a word that can have two different meanings or that is unclear. And so they mislead or they confuse by doing that. And so it's, it's a word game. It's word play in order to mislead. So let me give you some examples. When I asked you if I should turn left, you said right. So I was correct. Don't get mad at me because I turned right because you said right. So right can be right. I agree with you or right can be a direction. So it's a word that has a double meaning. So I'll give you another example. Well, I have a clear plan on the campus budget that accounts for every dollar spent. My opponent over here wants to throw money at special interest projects. Well, special interest project is vague. Nobody really knows, but it, it sounds negative. It sounds, it sounds like the person's got a very selfish, self-serving agenda. That's part of what this talk tactic is. Now, within complex trauma families, it can come out like this. A husband says to his wife that stays at home with three small children and cares for them. He comes home one day frustrated and says, well, at least I have a job. I just don't sit around all day at home. What? He's playing off. You just sit around at home as if she's doing nothing. Or there you are. On the phone again, I wonder what loser you're talking with now. So she's on the phone. It could be with somebody very important. It could be something from work. It could be with a close friend. But you're on the phone again. He's just adding a word that just muddles the thing and makes it sound negative. One other example would be, 
you're quite upset with how much your husband is out with his buddies. He's never at home with the kids. And so he says, I'll just see my friends a few times a month. Well, the word few is very vague. Does that mean two times, three times? You could say, well, it could be six, seven times. So he purposely uses a word that you might assume he means two or three times, but he can then use it, he's misled you. So that equivocation is very common. Next one is the red herring fallacy. And that was came out of the practice of if you send sniffer dogs to smell the scent of somebody that you're pursuing, a criminal that's escaped. And so what the criminal would do is he would take red herring, stinky fish with a very strong odor and put it on the path in a way that would mislead the dogs, that would put them off the scent and then he could escape. And so it became known as an attempt in an argument to shift the focus, to get them heading in a different direction and, and to get off the main point. So it's an attempt to mislead by bringing up an unrelated issue. So examples, you're complaining that you have to walk to school. Well, I have to, used to have to give my parents my entire paycheck. What's your entire paycheck as a kid have to do with walking to school? It's a red herring. Or I may be lazy and not clean up after myself, but at least I've never cheated on my partner. What's that got to do? But that's the diversionary tactic, the deflection. You point out to your husband something hurtful he's doing as, as a parent, and he responds by saying, oh, I just heard about a new book on parenting. Have you read it? It's just to get you off track. It's get you onto something else. Or a couple is arguing and the, one of them says, you never do the dishes. And the other one says, well, what about you? You never take out the garbage. Again, what's that got to do with anything? Women march for their rights on the street. And the prime minister stands up in parliament and he argues, these women should be grateful they live in a country where they can protest peacefully. Not responding to what they're marching about. That's the red herring. The next one is a super popular one as well, the appeal to pity fallacy. And that is when you're losing an argument, the way to sway the, the other person or the crowd is to just get them to feel sorry for you. So you try to provoke them emotionally. So a person comes in late again. I know I should have been on time, but I woke up late and I feel really bad about it. I just got so many bad things going on in my life right now and I haven't been sleeping well. And they just pull out the self-pity card. Or I shouldn't have hit you. Or I shouldn't have cheated on you. But you know, I've been going through a really rest, rough time lately. I'm just so stressed out. It's not really my fault is what they're trying to say. Give me another chance. Don't set a boundary. Don't enforce a consequence. Just feel sorry for me. Don't leave me because I would have no place to live and I become homeless. And so it's trying to evoke pity in others so that they will excuse what you're doing and let you away with it. The next one sadly is also very common in complex trauma and it's just sad and it's called the appeal to force fallacy and basically it is you better believe that what I'm saying is true because I'm going to enforce this through the threat of force so two examples you have to go to school because if you don't you're grounded so that's just the, there's going to be a consequence so you better do what you're told but the other one is just a sad one that happens in complex trauma and that is a girl that's been sexually abused by her uncle and he says, you're going to keep our little secret about what I do to you at night. If you ever tell anybody, I'll kill your brother. That's using the threat of force to win an argument, to get them to never challenge, to get them to never present the truth. And that sadly happens. And so that's where you'll get blackmail. That's where you'll get extortion. All of those are that threat of force fallacy. 
The next one is the appeal to a lack of evidence fallacy. So it's basically when you're in an argument and the other person, their whole basis for trying to refute you is you don't have enough information. There's not enough information to support what you're saying. You might have given fantastic evidence, but there's not tons of it. And so that's, they're just saying because there's a shortage or not quite as much as they would expect. Therefore, what you're saying is doubtful. Therefore, it can't be true. The opposite then must be true. And that's tricky because there's some importance in yeah, having lots of information. But what happens if it's a brand new field or that the research is fairly new and young doesn't mean that therefore the subject is not right. So examples. You might have gotten this if you've been talking to your family or friends about what you're learning um, and listening to our videos on complex trauma. And you talk to your friends about it and your friend comes back and says, oh, I looked on the internet. And there's hardly any information available on complex trauma. So it can't be true. And you go, whoa. But that's what some people will say. Or you go to your parents and say, I was sexually abused. And your parents go, that can't be true. Nobody else has said anything. Nobody else has suspected anything. I think you just must be making this up. And so because there doesn't seem to be tons of evidence other than your word, then it can't be true. And so that's, again, a very subtle thing, but it is commonly used. Next one, the loaded question fallacy. So the loaded question is a complex question that contains some falsehood or an assumption of unfounded presumption of guilt. And the whole purpose of them is to throw the person off, to get a secret agenda in, to get others to have questions in their mind, to raise doubts in other people. It, it's a desire to influence people with what sounds like the facts, but you have no basis to prove the facts. You're just kind of throwing out a false allegation is what it is. So some examples. You, you're in an argument with somebody and you're losing the argument and other people are listening in. You go, do you still beat your wife? You have no evidence they ever beat their wife. But you just throw that as an accusation, as a question, like you're looking for answers, but you, it's like you've already assumed they're guilty. And now everybody else is going to now look at what that person says differently. Or you're talking with somebody and all of a sudden you go, is the murder weapon where you still left it? Whoa, the, there's just all kinds of assumptions in there, all kinds of allegations in there that have very negative connotations and now how people think about that person and see them. Another one you might get is, do you still keep your drug paraphernalia? It just comes out of the blue. And it's like, what's that got to do with anything, what we're talking about? But it's to frame you as an, an addict that's still thinking of relapsing, an addict that's got a very troubled past. It's to influence how people think about you. So that loaded question is kind of fighting dirty. The next one is called begging the question fallacy. And again, this is very common and it's a bit tricky. So let me see if I can explain it. It's to state or assume as a premise for what your argument, the very thing that you're trying to prove. Or you're assuming the conclusion as you begin the argument. So for an example, a teenager asks their dad, who made you the boss? Dad said, I did. And they go, well, prove it. Well, I'm the boss because I say that I'm the boss. So that they've assumed they're the boss and now that's the premise for their argument. So that's what this begging the question is. They haven't answered the question by proving what makes them the boss. They just assume they're the boss and use that as their main argument. So the question is still begging for a correct answer. Another one would be there's nothing more powerful than love. Okay, so there's the uh, assumption. So then how are they going to approve that? Well, all the other emotions are weaker than love. 
So now, love's the most powerful emotion is the proof that there's nothing more powerful than love. That is begging the question. You really haven't established that. iPhone is the best smartphone on the planet because nobody makes a better phone than iPhone. Again, you, you're basing your proof on the conclusion you want. So that's begging the question. Another one connected to that is circular reasoning. And it's basically you begin with the premise and then you just cycle back. And it's circular reasoning. This is true because the premise is true. And how do I prove the pre how do I prove the premise by saying the premise is true? And it just goes in a circle. And so instead of offering evidence, you just simply keep repeating the conclusion that you want people to believe. So the parent says to the child, it's time to go to bed, and the child goes, Why? And the parent goes, because it's time to go to bed. Circular reasoning. The premise, you just restate it. Or, God must exist. Well, how do you know? Because it says so in the Bible. Okay, now it sounds like you're going to prove it. Well, how, why should I believe the Bible? Because God wrote the Bible. So, trying to prove God, you're using the thing that you say God wrote. So, you're circular reasoning. Another one is people have free choice or free will because they can choose what they do. So you're using the premise to try to prove the premise. So you'll get that a lot with gaslighters, with narcissists who just argue in circles and they're never really proving what they're saying. The final one and again, this one is super common in complex trauma, and it's called the bad reasons fallacy or the fallacy fallacy. And it basically says that you can have the best argument in the world and you can present all kinds of facts, but if I can find one flaw in your argument or one thing that isn't factually correct, then I'll just throw out your whole argument. So you you got a beautiful argument, but I go, oh, but that little piece is wrong, so everything's wrong. Or you didn't argue that correctly, so I, I disregard the whole argument. So if I can find one thing I don't like about your argument or one thing wrong with your argument, that gives me reason to discount your entire argument. And this happens all the time with couples who are arguing. Let's say you're arguing with your husband and you've clearly won the argument and, and proven that what he's thinking is wrong. And then he comes back and said, yeah, but you said that this was right, but really it's not 23%, it's 24%. Therefore, I, your whole argument's wrong. I don't have to listen to a thing you say because you got one little detail wrong. That is used all the time. So just an absurd kind of ex example just to really make this clear to you. So let's say Alex says, all foxes have tails, and the animal that just ran into the bush had a tail, so it must be a fox. So that's jumping to a conclusion and so Bob then goes, no, that's not true, which is right. Since just because an animal has a tail, that doesn't mean it's a fox. But then what he does is he goes, so the animal that ran into the bush wasn't a fox. So because you got one flaw in your argument, therefore I'm going to conclude the opposite. And so he's not right either because there's a flaw in his argument. So those are 30 argument fallacies that you're going to get all the time in complex trauma. And I really am hoping this just helps you because you're going to get in discussions, you're going to get in arguments, you're going to get narcissists in your face, gaslighters in your face, family in your face. And on the surface, what they say sounds kind of right and it's going to mess up your head and start to influence you. And I hope you're going to be able to take this information and go, oh, I see what they're doing. No, that's not right at all. That's a fallacy, and I'm not going to buy into that. And I see the problem. Just remember from last time what we said, and I just end with this, is if the person is open to change and is not a narcissist, not a gaslighter, you can point out these fallacies to them and say, hey, that, there's a flaw in that fallacy and they're going to be able to see it and go, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. And they're going to come around and you're going to grow through that experience. But if it's a narcissist 
and you point out, hey, that's, that's, an, that's an incorrect way of arguing. There's a flaw in your reasoning. It's not going to work. They're just going to take what you say and twist it even more and come up with another argument. And so if you realize that this argument that you're having is with a narcissist and it's full of fallacies, often it's wise just to not even bother trying to point it out. Just walk away because you're never going to win. You can't reason with them to an, an accurate perception because they don't want the truth. They just want to win the argument. So be aware of who you're having the argument with because that determines whether you point out the fallacies or whether you just walk away. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Hopefully that was helpful to